tonight. First of all, thank you again. Welcome, everybody. I want to introduce, first of all, Heidi Russell, my wonderful co-curator, who has been amazing all this time. I want to introduce my two artist friends, Colette Tompkins and Hello. And yeah, I'm going to I'm going to start talking about this manifesto, and then as we go, we're going to introduce each other uh, a little bit more. So I'm going to share my screen. Wait a second. Can everybody see see my presentation? Okay. Yes. Awesome. So, why have there been no great women artists? Um, this is a manifesto by Linda Nockwin. She was an amazing writer. Uh, actually, she is one of the most important feminist art historians. And she published this article in 1970, uh, 1971. Um, she she presented she precipitated she precipitated a paradigm shift within the discipline of art history. So this manifesto literally is a before and after in art history. Let's also take to count that this was written in the 70s. A lot of things nowadays can seem very normal for all the access that we have to information and social media and so on. But this was written in the 70s, so I really wanted to. To, do, to take your mind back then and do the, the comparison and take the analysis to nowadays. Oh, wow. Okay, so also this manifesto was written in a very important time. It was during, during a watershed year for women's liberation movement. Um, in 19, 1970 marked the fifth, the fifth anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment when women were able to actually vote. In the same year, both Sisterhood is Powerful, an anthology of feminist writings, and Germaine's Greer's The Female Anage were published, so very important um, feminist writings, and the Equal Rights Amendment was passed the U.S. House, the Ad Hoc Women Artist Committee was founded in New York, um, Yuri Chicago started being famous also in this era, doing a lot of feminist things. So yeah, this was an, an important time. It was the second feminist wave. You could say that nowadays we're actually living the, the third feminist wave. Um, I want to talk a little bit about who is Linda Nocklin. Linda Nocklin um, graduated with a BA in philosophy and a minor in Greek and, in Greek and art history from Basar College. And something that she mentions is that a good thing about growing, and I can also relate to her in this sense because I also st studied in an old women's college, is that the fact that growing up surrounded by women made her, when she wrote the manifesto, was easier for her to do all these comparisons because in an old women's school where everything was done by women, figured out by women, there was, there was no, gender role to be to be taken and yeah she's a foremost scholar of feminist art history she has authored numerous publications including art woman art power and other essays and she was also the key curator of the landmark exhibition women artists in between 15 um thousand oh i can never say the the the, um, the numbers right in, in in english 15 1550 and 1950 um so shortly after she began teaching art history in Basar College, she had a conversation. So all this manifesto started because she had a conversation with an acquaintance that changed her life. Let's remember that there was no social media back then. So this acquaintance um, brought to Linda Nocklin all this feminist um, propaganda. One of the most important was Red Stock, the, Red Talk, the Red Stocking newsletter. And she started reading all this propaganda that, the, um, that her friend brought to her and light bulbs starting shining in her head. She started realizing and going deep into 
into all these topics. And she says, that night reading until 2 a.m., making discovery after discovery, cartoonish light bulbs going in my head and at a frantic pace. My consciousness was indeed raised as it was to be over and over again within the course of the next year or so. Um, and also she, I'm, I'm putting into context all the things that came together in order for her to put this incredible essay, okay? She had the opportunity to talk with the art dealer, Richard Fagan at an event. And he said to her that he wanted to do a show with women artists, but he just couldn't happen to find good ones. And this blew her mind because Linda Nocklin was like, what do you mean? Of course, there's incredible women artists out there. You can't find good ones. Like this is, this is insane. Just the fact that this has to be, that this has to be questioned is just because there's not enough information. There's not, there's not a lot of things written about women artists. This is crazy because of course there's women artists out there. So yeah, this was, this was a, another of the big catalysts for her to, to write this. And this was the cover of the article in Art News of the essay. And why is it important? Because this is a, this is a work by Marie-Josephine Charlotte, which was thought to be painted by Jacques Louis, Louis David. So this painting thought that it was painted by a male when then, and then after they discovered that it was actually painted by, by a woman. So in the first half of the manifesto of, of why are there no great women artists, she goes to a very methodo methodological thesis that we in this talk are not gonna go, are not gonna go there. This talk we wanna go more of, of um, we wanna go more into the arguments and the thoughts around everything that she actually says in the, in the essay. Um, she quotes John Stuart Mills, who was one of the first masculine one of the first male feminist writers in 1869, because something that we have to think about is that we, we say that things, oh, this is normal because this is natural, this is the way that it has to be, but what does something, what, what is natural? You know, this is just something that also society has said to be natural. Before what was natural was women to get married and have kids and work in that household. Oh, this is natural. When, why is this natural, you know? I mean, I, I'm, I don't wanna get really off topic, but it's natural for women to be with men and men to be with women when nowadays we know that this is something completely open. So what is necessarily natural? And here I just want to do a little peek into one of my favorite books by Yuval Noah Harari, Sap Sapiens. I really recommend this book because it really explains this, this paradigm that Linda Knockling is saying in her, article about the feminine and the masculine, no? Before um, what was considered masculine was the curls, the stocking, the high heels, even makeup, you know? And then, and, and the women were at home having babies all sweaty, working. And so when was this, when was this shift, you know? And now what we consider masculine is this guy in a, in a suit, you know? So yeah, um, also why are there no great women artists is super biased because the fact that we're already asking ourselves this question means because implicitly there's something wrong in this question. So in, in, in not, not in conclusion, because of course we're just starting, but the biggest point in this essay and in this talk is that the fault lies not in our, in our stars or hormones or menstrual cycles or empty internal spaces, not even in our talent, not even in how we grew up. It doesn't have nothing, it has anything to do with women. Why are there no great women artists? It just lies in our institution and in our education. So here I'm gonna stop and I'm going to introduce Colette Tompkins to carry on with the, with the topic. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in, to ask, to interrupt, because this is, we want this more to be like a dialogue than a, an actually presentation and talk. And also if you have a question and you don't want to say it out loud, you can just go into the chat and say it and ask it. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Colette Tompkins and I'm going to carry on uh, kind of piggybacking off of 
what Aranza said. So just give me a second and I will be sharing my screen with you all. Okay, so Nachlan's point about the question, why there are no great women artists, um, is that it actually does not, um, it really doesn't uh, keep critical, critical to um, the patriarchal structures. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think, I think you, we, we, we're having some technical problems and I think we can still, we can see like your notes and not the actual presentation. Oh no, okay, give me a second. Sorry everyone, we were struggling with this at the beginning. How about now? Yeah, you got it. Okay. Um, so one of the things that it does not address is that the fact that there have been these patriarchal structures in place throughout art history. Um, so we have to ask questions like, for instance, why is Picasso this genius or such a great artist, but Rosa Bonheur is not? Um, and also questions like, who are the people writing history? What, um, what were the, who are the people in power? And really in this specific case, it was men, specifically white men. So um, this is also true in other cultural issues today. Uh, for instance, uh, poverty problem. It's usually, de it's defined by the wealth, uh, violence against women, men being the violence against women. Uh, this idea of what Nachlin calls the woman problem, um, she states it's not, it doesn't have to do with our hormones, it doesn't have to do with our biology, it doesn't have to do with our menstrual cycles, um, it really has to do with the restrictions that were put upon us by who, who were in power, um, who was running the institutions at the time, and because of that, it's, it's not it's not inherently a woman's problem. Um, now, this is gonna lead me to show you my video. So in my video, I have a quote by Julia Penelope, and it states, he beat her, she was beaten by him, she was beaten, she was battered, she is a battered woman. Um, and this really points to how language such as why some like such as why what Nachlin calls like the woman problem or not necessarily what she calls it she puts it in parentheses this is why it's so problematic because it's actually removing the oppressor the the subject of the problem out of it and taking and for a lack of a better word um making it the victim's issue and it's not necessarily a victim's issue it's the person causing the the oppression who's who's the problem. And so the next uh, point that Nachlin makes is that in she insists rather us as women focusing ourselves, um, focusing on ourselves as being inadequate, that we must understand that we are actually equal and we do have a voice in the art world 
and as well as other endeavors. Um, this is where I do feel like the quote also that's in my video, feminism is not women as victims, but women's refusing to be victims by Gloria Steinem comes in. Um, and that, you know, we really should be, and really we have to be creating, creating a world where we are not only we're equal, but our achieve, achieve, achievements um, are able to be made and will be made and also supported by social institutions um, such as museums or academies and such. Um, and, you know, the question itself uh, really points to why, going back to like why there are no great women artists, um, it's actually an intellectually inadequate idea about um, this type of myth of the great artist or um, the genius. Um, and it's really an uncritical assumption of what actually goes into art making in general, um, such as uh, technique, materiality, and uh, conceptualization. Um, and these are these are then uh, compounded in art history, uh, and you know talked about as this like more of this like romantic view of how the artist came to be, such as. Jackson Pollock or Van Gogh, um, how they were thought they were thought to be so great and so talented. And these artists weren't just magically discovered. Um, and it's really more due to their privilege or of attending an institution or having some sort of social privilege, uh, class privilege. And um, and or patronage uh, that really allow these artists to rise and become who they were in history and mark themselves um, in the art history that we know today. Uh, and in contrast, uh, women were really weakened into submission by the male dominant by male dominant society, a uh, patriarchal society. And, you know, we were pressured into getting married and taking care of the husband and supporting um, the male and in, in his career choices. Um, and really um, their artistic endeavors um, or other endeavors for that matter, uh, weren't taken as uh, seriously. Um, and nor were they really, like they weren't even really allowed to. Um, here in this, this photo, or not in this photo, excuse me, not in this photo, but in this painting, this is actually of men in an art class. And, um, they weren't like women were not allowed to paint um nudes or have uh live models and that was up until pretty recent um and so now going into this i'm going to segue and introduce uh paya so i'm gonna um, i'm gonna i'm gonna interrupt you for a sec just sure. to mention that in that and in that slide that you have before the reason that, that, that the bust is circled is because, as you say, women um, were not allowed to be in the same room with a naked male, but they were allowed to be naked for males to, yes. to draw them. But the reason that, that the bust is circled because um, this artist, that, oh my God, I forgot her name, but she, she be, you see, like I forgot her name. Why don't I have her name in the top of my head when we should, you know, because she was the only woman that was actually in the academy. Like that's how wrong, like this proves the whole point of the essay. But the, she was represented in this picture as a, as a bust because we, it, it was not allowed for her to be painted with all the men and that naked man in there. So that's why they were like, oh, how can we rep how how can we take her in count without her being there? Let's let, let's represent her as a mm -hmm. as a bust. Yeah, and even mm -hmm. women in the class weren't even allowed to draw women nude, which I think is also where we can go on and into the talks. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna um continue with uh um i'm gonna start by sharing my screen so my name is paola 
uh, people call me Pi. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. So yeah, basically taking it from uh, where Colette uh, left. Uh, yeah, for such men, uh, so in, the, in this part of the manifesto, um, for such, uh, it says like, for such men, the real work of women is only that which directly or indirectly serves the family. So I think that um, obviously we have a problem there, right? And we feel like, okay, that is like gone from our way of thinking or society, but actually is like very present still, right? So I'm gonna start by going back um, 40 years before the manifesto was written to this room, this um, book written by Virginia Woolf, uh, because she's also gonna be present in the work that I'll be showing. And the book is called A Room of One's Own. And um, it, it talks a lot about the role of women in society um, in 1929, uh, where she argues for both a literal and figurative space for women writers within a literary tradition dominated by men. So uh, through this metaphor uh, that we, we see that a woman must have money and a room of her own if she's to write fiction. Uh, what she means by that as well is uh, in connection to what um, the manifesto says, is that like in literally as in literature as in life, even if the woman commitment to art was a serious one, she was expected to drop her career and give up the commitment uh, of love and marriage, right? So um, even if uh, the woman was committed to, to being an artist, she was always, the, the, her role in the art world was always like a hobby or something that she could like accompany her, her, her life or her curiosities, but it was never taken as seriously as uh, the man, right? And uh, so that will take me to the next slide. Uh, yeah. So I think that, that it's important to say that there was a price and maybe there still is a price to pay uh, if women pursue their careers and it shouldn't be that way, right? And in the manifesto, um, it mentions uh, in those refreshingly straightforward pre-Freudian pre pre days, Rose Evaner could explain to her biographer that she had never wanted to marry for fear of losing her independence. Too many young girls let themselves be led to the altar like lambs to the sacrifice, she maintained. So like, it sounds a little bit dramatic, but in a way um, it, it, it was like, there was, it was a huge sacrifice. Uh, so a lot of women weren't allowed to get married if they pursued their careers, uh, her careers as artists. And I think that that also puts into context that, that it has been, this has been going on for many, many, many years and many generations. And that also like sort of is uh, craved within our way of understanding the world uh, in which um, I think this message is not only sent um, uh, to, to women, to men, sorry, but also to women uh, who like support unconsciously the, the, the uh, like, um, uh, patri uh, like a patriarch a patriar patriarchal society. Sorry, I'm going to the next one. Um, yeah, so uh, in the work that I'm gonna show, uh, the significances attached to the body are very relevant uh, because there was like a whole, there's a whole history where the body uh, has been objectualized without uh, the choice of the woman over it. I personally don't think there's nothing wrong if a woman wants to objectualize her body, but this was like automatically done by society. And in the section of uh, the manifesto, there's a part where, about the question of the nude, um, where yeah, it says like uh, lady students were not admitted uh, to life drawing at the Royal Academy in London. And even when they were after that date, the model has to partially draped, you know? So it's like, had to be partially draped. So like people weren't allowed, women like their body was used, but at the same time, they couldn't take like owner, ownership for uh, their actions uh, through the, the body. Um, I'm going to the next one. So now I'm gonna show the work. Please stop me if it's like uh, glitching.
It is a strange fact, but a true one, that up to this moment she had scarcely given her sex a thought. It was not until she felt the coil of skirts about her legs that she realised with a start the penalties and the privileges of her position. It was not caused, simply and solely, by the thought of her chastity and how she could preserve it. The whole edifice of female government is based on that foundation stone. Chastity is their jewel, their centrepiece, which they run mad to protect and die when ravished of. She had insisted that women must be obedient, chaste, scented and exquisitely apparelled. Now I shall have to pay in my own person for those desires, she reflected. For women are not, judging by my own short experience of the sex, obedient, chaste, scented and exquisitely apparelled by nature. The sight of my ankles means death to an honest fellow. I must, in all humanity, keep them covered. She fell to thinking what an odd pass we have come to, when all a woman's beauty has to be kept covered, lest a sailor may fall from a masthead. Realising for the first time what, in other circumstances, she would have been taught as a child, the sacred responsibilities of womanhood, to be the slave of the frailest chit in petticoats, and yet to go about as if you were the lords of creation. What fools they make of us. What fools we are. Must I then begin to respect the opinion of the other sex, however monstrous I think it? I must. Upon which a gloom fell over her. Better is it, she thought, to be clothed with poverty and ignorance, which are the dark garments of the female sex. Better to leave the rule and discipline of the world to others. Better be quit of martial ambition, the love of power, and all the other manly desires. If so, one can more fully enjoy the most exalted raptures known to the human spirit, which are contemplation, solitude, love. She was horrified to perceive how low an opinion she was forming of the other sex. Because you see a woman's ankles, to dress up like a guy forks and parade the streets so that women may praise you. To deny a woman teaching lest she may laugh at you. Let me cut you just the tiniest little slice the size of your fingernail. At those words, a delicious tremor ran through her frame. Then she had pursued. Now she fled. Which is the greater ecstasy? The man's or the woman's? And are they not perhaps the same? Yeah. So, um... The audio of that uh, video is uh, an excerpt from the book of Orlando written by Virginia Woolf when she realizes, so basically in, in the book, uh, to give a little bit of context, uh, Orlando one day wakes up and now he is, uh, I, I don't know if anyone hasn't read this, but <laughs> I think it's like, it, it's part of the explanation. I'm go not going to be spoiling it because it's a magnificent book that you should read anyhow. But he has a one day, um, Orlando wakes up and he's a woman, right? And uh, she, starts, she starts to realize the effect that her body has uh, on the people that surround her. So she's like basically in a boat and the wind blows uh, a little bit her skirt and her legs are exposed. And she realizes that the reaction of the people around her, uh, it's very different from when um, she was a man, right? So like, it's also important, uh, I think, uh, to uh, drawing back to what we were talking about, like the social connotations attached to what uh, the, the body of women represent, what the role of women in society is. 
And I'm gonna go to the next slide. So I think that it's important to mention that at the same time, like, well, around the same time that the manifesto was written, um, well, women in the art world were doing a lot of uh, performance, right? So they started to be present in the work. They started to reclaim uh, their place, their body. So they stopped being not uh, only muses and only the uh, figures or like the models that were being painted or drawn. And they started to reclaim the body, right? And also they started to confront uh, society's notions of disgust in relation to the female body by working a lot with, um, yeah, menstruation and like presenting the, uh, yeah, the woman not only as this like beautiful lady being, but also like these other sides that uh, shape also what a woman might be. This uh, a woman like uh, can get angry. A woman uh, can. Um, there's a quote in Spanish that says "calladita te ves más bonita," which is like you are better when you you look better when you shut up. You know. So they start to like sort of fight against that through performance, through the work, and well. Uh, I'm gonna go to my last uh, slide, and uh, which is like it's just like um, oh, yeah. So I just think that uh, the manifesto is still very relevant because even though uh, it it does uh, some of the things in the manifesto are a bit, uh, we feel that they're a bit outdated because things have changed. There is also this need to. Uh, change a lot of how we educate ourselves uh, about uh, our role in society, right? And uh, what what a woman is, uh, what a woman represents, right? Because this has been going for generations and from generation to generation. So it's difficult to make these changes and it will still take a lot of time. And with this, I will go back to um, Aranza again uh, through she was, she's going to present a work that does this, right? Um, so like reclaims uh, the, the through performance. Um, yeah, so what self-esteem is, what the perception of ourselves, but she can explain this uh, in detail to you guys. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. <laughs> thank you, thank you, bye. Um... Wow, it's my turn to talk again. I always have to accept I always get a little bit ner nervous and emotional when I present this, when I present this performance. Um, when I actually did it, I, I got very nervous as well, but it's super, it's very different talking about it than actually doing it. It's a different kind of vulnerability, but I'm not gonna, this is, that, that's not the point. The point is to talk, to talk about how this is, um, related to the to the topic so uh something something that it's important to to think about is that i would have never been able to do this work if i was born in the in the 50s or back maybe in the 60s and the 70s i would have been able to to do this performance and they would have been maybe very revolutionary you know, um, before that, don't even think about it. I wouldn't be able to do them. Right now, doing them can seem even kind of normal because we can think that we are very ahead, but we are actually not. We're actually very, very behind. And I know that we're talking about art, but I just want to share a personal experience that, sh that shows how, how ingrained we're in society with all this difference. The, the, um, the other day I needed to hire someone through this page that's called Upwork. And I wanted to find someone to help me out with a video. And I automatically, when I started search searching for people, I was searching for men. I was like, I need a man to help me with a video. And then I stopped myself and I'm like, why am I only looking at man's profile to to help me do with this video. And I realized, and I'm like, wait a second, I'm going to prioritize women, you know? And that's how, how ingrained we have it in, in society that for certain roles, we think about men and not women at all, you know? The same with, with, um, with and I don't consider myself sexist. And I'm, I mean, to start with, I'm a woman, you know? 
But for example, it also happens with people of color. I was talking in the phone with a with a person helping me out um, resolve something um, in the bank, and we got the conclusion that I had to go there to resolve it in person. And when I arrived, I saw that the person was a person of color, and and it it did surprise me because in the phone I I assumed that it was a, a white male, and when I saw him, I'm like. I actually, I was, it was awesome. I was like, yes, I love it. You know, not that I have anything against white male, but it's just an example of how society and how the world has worked from now has it, has the, has the cables in our head um, wired, you know? So at the end of the day, I think a lot has to do with uh, the way that this has changed is because women, people of color and minorities in general have really owned it. And that's how the world slowly has been opening more and more to all this naturality, which at the beginning, I don't know why certain things were not natural, you know, but that's also a, another topic. So as Paola said, the performance that I, that I did has to do with ownership and self-esteem and I didn't do them because I have a big self-esteem where I own everything. I might show myself as a very strong person, but inside and when I'm alone, I'm a human being like everyone else, but it's definitely an analysis into, into, into self-esteem, ownership and identity. So when I was a when I when I was a kid, I don't know why I really loved dressing up as as my dolls. So so yeah, not only as my like I I, I like this kind of analyzing my identity in in a way that I mirrored it. Of course, I didn't know what I was doing when I was a kid, but as I started growing up and when I started developing the selfie project, and I had to go back to analyze why. I do certain things. That's when I started jumping into patterns. And this is a very long project that I did for a whole year and has so much stages. And I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna take that that much of your time. So I'm gonna go kind of kind of fast through it, right? So the selfie project consisted in me taking a selfie and then that selfie making it into a tattoo and putting it on myself. And after I did that, I took another selfie, I made it into a temporary tattoo again and I put it on myself. And I did this for quite a few rounds until I did a fifth round and I didn't do more because you, you can't really see the selfie inside the selfie anymore if I, if I took it further, right? So when I did this stage, I, I went into a, into a trip of analysis of who I am, where do I come from? I'm a, uh, I'm a Mexican artist that just arrived into New York and my whole identity changed because I changed country. Um, I started going to art school for the first time. I started being independent in a way for the first time because I lived by myself after living in a country where my family is near and my friends are near. So I started questioning all, um, I started questioning myself all these factors of identity, right? Um, I come from a Catholic school, uh, which I was always against it growing up. Mm. When in a way now I think it was a blessing because it helps me mirror and do a lot of comparisons because I feel that if I had never studied here there would be a lot of things that I would be blinded to not that a lot of privilege blinded me already but I don't know it just helps me mirror a lot of things and again another factor of identity I I did my uniform with my selfie as well um, there's a lot of things that I can talk about this project uh, but all this reflecting myself and putting my image in different things and seeing how I felt and, 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 and going deeper made me re um, did a lot of changes in, in, in my self-esteem as well. I had always a lot of problems feeling fat all the time, not being comfortable with my body and the selfie performance, analyzing myself and looking at, at deeper aspects made me think different of me in a, in a lot of ways. So I kind of created my, my own uniform with my selfie as well. And another stage of the selfie project was when I, when I did the rounds of tattoos, I went around in art fair, I went around in art fairs almost naked with a selfie stick, taking selfies of myself, selfies of myself in front of in front of art pieces and 
people were like very impressed, you know, first of all, because they see a woman full of tattoos and they think I'm crazy and like, oh my God, how did you dare do that? And then they were like, oh, are they real or are they fake? They are fake. I have, I have one that it's real that I, that I actually, I actually did myself as a final stage of my project. But we, I, I started questioning, um, I started, que I started, questioning the people in the art first, you know, what is, what is art? What is the difference between narcissism and, and self-love? What was their reaction when they see a woman full of tattoos? If it would it be different if it was a man? And all this performance um, goes around these questions. So, and then there's, there's more stages, more projects that I did within this project, but something also interesting about this project is when I, when I entered the art fairs, First I entered with a coat and then I went into the art fair. I took the coat off. I gave the coat to the coat check and then I started walking and it's a very vulnerable, very vulnerable moment. And then as I started walking through the art fair and feeling comfortable with my body, when I left those art fairs, I felt completely, completely empowered. So this also makes us, makes me, I don't wanna say us, I wanna make it, make it personal. This made me feel, uh, what is what gave me force? Owning my body, the approval of people around me, uh, realizing that it was, yeah, it was kind of fun. Like all these questions around this act took me to like all these different tangents as well. And at the end, I, I concluded that ownership of our identity and ownership of our own, our, our own body is what's really gonna push us forward and that requires sometimes a very brave act of of going past our own boundaries and just jumping it's like oh no I hate speaking in public well if you jump and you like actually start speaking in public you're going to realize that it's not that bad oh I hate sharing my work well if you do it you're going to realize that it's not that big of a deal oh my god what would it be naked what would it be to walk naked in an art fair well if you do it you'll realize that it's not not that bad you know so this is where I talk about ownership and self-esteem and identity. Um, another project that has to do with, with the same thing, but in a different aspect, and I'm gonna get a little bit religious here um, because I've been a practicing Buddhist for the, five, for the past five years, which you would think that that's a lot, but compared to, um, that it's nothing actually studying five years of Buddhism. The, the ocean of Dharma that is out there is so huge that five years of Buddhism, I could say there's still nothing. But um, I started studying this female, this female deity called Green Tara. I really love this feminine Buddha. She, she's also considered as the mother Buddha, very similar to the version of Guadalupe, a version that we have in Mexico that is also represented with a color green and is also the mother. I mean, of course, Virgin Mary is the mother of, of, of Jesus in a way. So we see like all these comparisons. But again, this is not a conversation for this topic. Um, I love her because she is the only female deity that is sitting with a foot outside the lotus. She's ready to take action. She's ready to take ownership. She's not just sitting around. She's not just sitting with her eyes closed, meditating and blessing blessing us all i mean of course she's blessing us all but she's ready to take action right so one of the meditations of of, of green tara is when you concentrate on her mantra you kind of embody her i don't want to go that deep into buddhism but there's two paths there's sutra and there's tantra sutra is when you actually <clears throat> um meditate and this is gonna sound Catholic, which is not Catholicism, but I'm gonna explain it through there. It's when you actually like talk to the deity to, to get help and get blessings. But all the Tantra path, which has nothing to do with, with, with sex, that's also like a misunderstanding in, in contemporary society, well, or depending also what kind of Buddhism do you study. Tantra is when you embody the deity. When you're not only saying the mantra to try to, get good vibes. I'm saying it in very conventional language here to make it easy and understandable and digestible. But when you actually say the mantra, you actually embody the deity. You actually imagine that you're the deity. And it's just not a question of like, oh, I'm going to be the deity right now, even if I'm super egocentric and I don't care about others. No, like it's all through meditations and studying that you come to the point that when you do her mantra, you actually want to feel that you are the deity. So I started doing this performance called 
becoming Green Tara, where I, when I, where I actually wanted to physically transform myself into Green Tara, which this in a way is a contradiction because Buddhism is, has nothing to do with the outside and it's all with the inside. But again, we represent things physically in the arts to explain deeper topics, right? So in Becoming Green Tara, my point was to try to keep her mantra all the time in my head and do everyday things, really trying to see how, how would it be to be Green Tara, which of course I am far, 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 far from, from, from becoming her. Um, so one of the experiences that I, that I had in, in my studio, something that I do want to mention, Sorry. Um, something that I do want to mention is that this performance was was very controversial in in art school because I started getting a lot of um, a lot of questions into is this cultural appropriation? Like, is it right to do this? It has to do a little bit with a with a black face in a way. So this I feel that this made it made it more interesting and made me question also more things around those topics, which at the end of the day, I did defend this performance saying that it's not cultural appropriation one, because I mean, at the end of the day, it's a deity, it's a female Buddha, the people at my Buddha center who were the ones that should be angry were the ones that loved this performance the most. And at the end of the day, um, we say Buddhism comes from India, but at the end of the day, it's completely global and has nothing to do at the end of the day with the country that, that you're from, right? So. Um, in this performance, a man came into my studio and he started crying. He started talking to me as if I was actually Green Tara. He, he was like, I've been studying Buddhism for 20 years. Green Tara, it's a, big, it's a big deity for me. I was thinking about her right before coming here. And then I enter your studio and I see you dressed up as, as Green Tara. And for me, you are Green Tara. Like there's no... There's, there's no other way to, to see it. For me, you are, you're completely Green Tara. And it was a very, a very intense, intense moment. And there I realized the power that, that, that we have as artists, as human beings, as potential Buddhas, if you want to think about it that way. So now I'm going to conclude this. Um, I'm going to conclude this talk. So at the end of the day, why are they no great, why are there no great um, female artists, why are there no great um, women artists, is because of the way the system is built and it's explained, it's to ben it was always to benefit men because we were always seen as a minority. And at the end of the day, there's amazing female, female artists out there at the same time that all these artists the, all these male artists were famous, but they were just kept in obscurity because they were not given the position that they should have been given because they also didn't have the option to do what we're doing right now. For me, it's very easy right now to walk naked in an art fair. 30 years ago, maybe I would be in jail and my performance might have been a little bit more interesting than what is now actually, but that's not the topic again. So a lot of artists um, also, I don't want to diminish the talent of anyone here. I know that Picasso was super, super talented since he was a little boy. I don't, I don't want to diminish anyone's talent, but something that we do have to take in mind is that all, a lot of um, artists had the, are in the position that they are because there's all these myths around them, how they were created, you know? Again, Jackson Pollock, yeah, he created a new form of artwork, you know, but he was always, he was also talked about in this very bougie and amazing way, like, oh, it's something super new and this man. And so that's also something that we have to think of nowadays that's happening with artists right now. Not that they're not talented, not that they're amazing, but yeah, it's also the media and what other people say around them. What is reality at the end of the day? What is written about them or what really happened, you know? So yeah, for example, Picasso, as I say, yeah, when he was 13 years old, he did incredible portraits. And then he had like all these different stages, his blue stage, his cubist stage, and he was a great artist. But I mean, as you can see, this is Lyubov Popova, 
an amazing Cubist artist at the same time that Picasso, at the same time that the Cubist stage of Picasso, okay, and maybe she wasn't as incredible as Picasso in the sense that maybe her career wasn't wasn't like, like Picasso's, but if she was doing this kind of Cubism at the same time that Picasso was doing it, why, why doesn't anybody know about her? And as I say, this can take us to a thousand tangents and a lot of discussions why, why something is done the way that it's done, but these are just things to think about, you know, the same way as Kandinsky. And like, yeah, this is Hilma af Klimt, you know, I mean, and then again, we can talk, yes, but Hilma af Klimt hit her work for 10 years and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but, but I mean, but, but she, came, she came out into society more than 40 years now and her first solo show was three years ago at the Guggenheim for the first time, you know, why? Why was this not in the 60s or in the 70s or in the 80s? And why until now? Why is Hilma F. Klimt famous until now, you know? Did we know about her? The same with Renoir. There were amazing impressionist women out there. Like Bert, like Bert Morris said as, as well. And, and we say that, um, we say, oh yeah, but the thing is that that, that female female artists um, only painted uh, everyday things, motherhood. I mean, sorry, but Renoir painted motherhood and everyday things as well. So there's no difference at all. So at the end of the day, the conclusion of this talk is the fault lies not in our stars or hormones or menstrual cycles or empty internal spaces in our talent in anything, absolutely anything. Why are there no great woman artists? It's just because of inst our institutions and our education. And there's no other way to put it. So yeah, this is, this is, um, this is the end of our presentation. And now I would love to, I would love to to open to open to the public. I don't know if Paola and Colette, you want to jump in, or if anybody has a question, or like really, this is the this is the, the opportunity to go a little bit more deep. Um, yeah, I mean, I can. Um, I think that. Uh, you know how we we do speak about Picasso being this like great artist. Um, something that stuck with me was um, your point where you're talking about. Well, he was he was a, he was still very talented at a very young age. Um, but the thing is, is that there's a lot of women who are very talented at a very young age. So I don't think we should be as apologetic to that as um, you know um, as we make it out to be because. Um, by at the end of the day, yes, it was because he had um, more of a patronage because he was a male um, that he was able to advance his career. Um, I do feel like, of course, there are people who are naturally gifted and, you know, women being, you know, part of that um, at a very young age. So I think I understand where we don't want to, you know, be like, oh, we don't want to be too mean to the men. But at the same time, at least for me, I feel very unapologetic. And I'm like, they had all of history. It's our turn. <laughs> um, and oh, no. oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent completely. There's nothing to be apologetic ab ab about it. I. I just said it because I wanted to explain that we are not blind to all the things that can can go around it. You know, that's why there's no reason to be apologetic at all. It's it's our time. We have to own it, and many other reasons. If I mention it, is just to see that we are not blinded around all these things. Why are there no great women artists? You know, we're 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 not not blinded about it at all. It's just to to like prove again the point it has nothing to do to to do with with what what their talent is or anything at the mm -hmm. end of the day is really the institution there's a there's a um, there's interesting com conversation going on in the in the chat i want to yeah. read it aloud for everyone um Enid Farber says, as a female jazz photographer, I know only too well 
how even women musicians hire male photographers much more than other women, of course. Um, I also got a question. Um, I, I will send the links to, to my performance and my, um, and we'll, we'll send the links to everything if you want to watch it again in the chat. I know people are asking where can they see the full video of the performance and, and everything that we shared. We'll, we'll share the, the links. Um, and Janet says, um, Pollock was also screwing Peggy Guggenheim who supported him and bought his work. <laughs> That's also something to take to take in account, of course. And Picasso was not cooking and cleaning and doing dishes and laundry, et cetera, et cetera. He got women to do it for him. Yeah, that's also another thing. This is also another thing to mention. We didn't have the chance to be to do our careers. With we we didn't have the chance to 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 pursue the things as men are pers pursuing the same way that people of color didn't have the chance to have the education that white people have because before they were not only slaves for a long time, but there was also this, um, this period of segregation that we have to take in account. It's the same with, with women, you know? So yeah, I mean, we are very disadvantaged. That, that's why now, nowadays it's very important to support women artists, hire women in, in all the sense. And, and yeah, think about hiring, hiring women and- I also believe in <laughs> like in inclusion. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that that um, when it comes to like different feminine, uh, feminist uh, discourses, I always sort of lead more into inclusion, right? Because I think that women were also, I mean, of course women were oppressed, but I do think that they were also, they're also part of the problem in a way. Like I can go back to my family, I can go back to my friends, like, and uh, like they have also supported this system. You know? So I do believe that the way to move forward, it's like together. I don't even like believe in this like separation of uh, men, women. I, I, I think that it's more about like these gray areas, you know, in which everyone has a chance, but it's also, I understand, like a utopia. <laughs> but I think we should all like fight for that in a way. I think, uh, so yeah, you know. I think it goes honestly back to even the essay um, where, you know, we talk about the women problem and it's not necessarily about women because it like feminism isn't only about women, right? It's it's also a man issue. It's a, it's a gender issue. Like, you know, we don't wanna be binary here. And I think that's really, it is going back to, you know, we, we can say that we do blame women for like upholding these, uh, these structures. Um, I don't know how much we can say we blame them if, you know, if that is what they taught other than like they need to learn and you know that's I think growth is like a big part of this is learning and being open-minded and understanding that it, this is also a men's issue um I mean in the essay though it does say itself that um those I I, I don't remember the exact quote but basically those who aren't oppressed and have the privilege aren't willing to really give it up even no matter how much they speak about even as much as they support the cause they they're not necessarily willing to give up their privilege and i think that's honestly where where change will come into i think necessarily these words like inclusion are almost like um you know, I, I don't want to say band-aid words, but they're they're these like superficial like, oh, we have a we have a woman, we have a woman in our gallery, and then there's like 10 men on the list, or we have a person, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, we're inclusive, but like, are you inclusive? So, uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think I meant also like women with men, you know, like so like in both ways. Like I completely agree with the and I think that's one of my favorite parts of the manifesto. Mm -hmm. Where it mentions like like, uh yeah, when one has power, you know, like you naturally hold on to that power, and yeah. that's true. But since that is changing, and we're like fighting for that change, yeah. I believe that it should be you know like looking forward. I think that uh, I remember in one talk one day someone was saying like, 
there's no ego when you work between women, you know? And I was like, that's oh, not true. true. You know what I mean? Like ego is survival, you know? <laughs> like we are all like... What you were calling inclusion, well, you know, they used, used to talk, talk about tokens. Oh, we've got a token, you know, Hispanic. We've got a token this. When you were talking mm -hmm. about they have like, you know, nine men and one woman or whatever. Oh, yes, we have inclusion. You know, years ago, we were talking about tokens. One thing I wanted to say um, about uh, women and talent and men and just anybody, you know, I was thinking, you know, it could be in simple terms of nature and nur nurture. Nature, you got lots of talent. Is anybody nurturing it? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, well, I think in, in, in a very simplistic way. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of it does go also back to the article in the sense of, you know, women were meant to nurture their family, right? So they, their, their careers got left behind and were throw, not, not left behind necessarily, but you know, they weren't taken as seriously because they needed the support, whether it be their children or their male counterpart and within their careers, right? So, you know, again, going with women's identity of being nurturing um where i think not uh linda knocklin is saying you know like we don't necessarily need to be that <laughs> um you know we can be like these like and this is like again coming out of like second wave feminism of you know being these very like for a lack of a better term like boss women uh hard like you know um which is maybe a little outdated for today i think it's like the point that we can do we can do everything which is you know well, then you're getting into women in power how do you oh. show power like uh at that point with the boss women they're wearing shoulder pads there was a whole error yeah so, yeah. No, yeah and and, and this, uh, it's something that that linda also mentions that in her in her talk when she talks about um this artist called rosa bonheur that she was uh, yeah. Reza Bonner did a lot of did a lot of landscapes and and scenes of, of the farm and a lot of animals and in back then they could say like oh she paints like a man you know and that was Reza Bonner yeah if you did yeah and like a man yeah and and also something that it's that that, that Linda mentions is that Rosa Bonheur she dressed like a man and she acted like a man and that's why in male and male society was accepted as a painter and was admired as a painter in a way because she was like them you know mm -hmm. she if she was this feminine figure and you know what I mean which which again the terms right now really really you don't matter but she was accepted by men because she copied the men at the end of the day you know so then does this makes it does this makes it fair no I mean a bit, way before women also, in power were seen as bit as witches I also think that, I think also it's important mentioning though that uh she she actually got mad about when she was asked about how, why she dressed like a man um because she was like i have like a thousand like dresses and i can dress like a woman but i'm i do it because it's my job like it I, i'm not gonna go and paint or ride a horse in a dress i'll i'll fall you know um and i think that's that's a really important thing is that it wasn't that she, she felt that she had to dress like a man it was just those were the clothes that made sense those were that that was a logical choice um which to me going back you know second wave going again back to second wave feminism feminism and having like these shoulder pads and the you know the suits it was very much about associating yourself with that masculinity where i think today is more about breaking that mold you know um it's 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 embracing the feminine but and understanding that you know masculinity nor femininity there's no gender to it really right it's that that's exactly and i think that uh like from what you're what you're talking about where it comes where she mentions again like that there was always like a sacrifice when it came mm -hmm. to women. 
So it's like, oh, so if now you're a woman artist, then you have to sacrifice either your family or you being taken seriously or looking like a feminine woman. Right? Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, so that part that you had to give something in order to developing your... Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, now, nowadays, I feel that you have to give up something in a way, but just not because because you're a woman or you're a, you're a man. It's because the choices that you have to that you have to make, you know. And like, I, if you want to, no. I do think that still today, obviously, not as much as you know during maybe the seventies, but I do think in, it's an eternal, it's an eternal internalized uh, feeling um, that you do feel the, the pressures of juggling like family life versus um, artistic practice. Um, you know, I do think there are sacrifices made, not that there aren't sacrifices made in any type of um, career choice, but I, I do think it hits a little differently for, us women than it does for our male counterparts for sure i don't think it's as bad though or as much as it was um but i do think there is definitely work to be done there um but definitely i mean there is a difference like it's what we were talking about it's it embedded in the system right yeah you know, a way of understanding there will we still google male photographer to hire <laughs> yeah. that's like it's embedded in the system so like yeah there's a lot of work to do, but still, like the, we've we've also also like uh, moved forward. A yeah. Lot, I think, right. So. But I think what we have to do is really in like really internalize it and realize it, and and it's so easy to see it. You know, it's so easy to see it. But what happens when when we we take it personal? You know, like when I realized that I was looking for male photographers, and I was like, what? You know. And this is gonna sound this is gonna sound um, very weird, but let's remember that I'm that I'm from Mexico, and there's some people from Mexico hearing this, so I want to mention it. Sometimes we're like, oh no, I'm not racist. Oh, I support LGBTQ. I, I like I support this, but yeah, but but what happened if you had a children that was gay? Would you be cool with it? You know, what happens um, when like would you really hire a woman to do certain things? Would you hire a woman to construct? The ceiling of, of of your house you know like so it's it's easy to see them but the 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 real re, that the real thing comes when we when we own it and we make it personal and i think this is questions that people are not really asking themselves you know also uh um, something that i that i want to mention and, and you're gonna you're it's something that we talked one day paula remember when you were like i'm so pissed that women, that men nowadays in, in, in I'm, I'm gonna talk about Mexico, men nowadays have to ask the hand of the daughters to get married. And there's this whole celebration ar around it. Why can't women be the one asking for the hand, you know? And okay, it's a beautiful tradition that has been coming from ages, but if you really think deep about it is, why, <laughs> you know, why is it yeah. the man always asking? Um, to get married why is it the man asking for the hand I mean okay yeah this traditions it's traditions and I think that it's important for some traditions to pervade because they're beautiful they're cool they're nice and people like them but we have to think the really deep matters around this tradition and what's the kind of world that that we that we want and not impose it in others if you like that kind of stuff okay it's great but then just don't give Sorry to say, don't give shit to others who don't mm -hmm. want to be there, you know? I think it's also, I, I actually, I mean, in in the U.S. they have it, at least in more, you said you went to a Catholic school, so did I. So that was something that was prevalent. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think, I do think tradition can be a great thing. I mean, you know, a lot of cultures are, are tied to tradition. Um, I mean, food is tr like, you know, tied to tradition. Um, and I think that's great. It's just, you know, you, it, like you were saying uh, to internalize and when is this tradition oppressing other people or oppressing me? You know, when when is it time to stop a tradition and maybe make new ones, you know? Um, which I think leaving room for making new traditions that are appropriate for everybody um, and who, in what's not hurting 
another is when we have to start doing that, you know, rewriting, rewriting our history through the lens of somebody else rather than our religious background or rather than the oppressor's historical beliefs or in what we're talking about tradition, right? Um, I think that's a big thing that's been actually happening, at least in the US, especially during the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and a lot of, you know, um, and a lot of the protests during the summer and like taking down a lot of the racist driven statues, right? People are like, oh, well, this is tradition. This is history. But, you know, whose history is it? Is it like who wrote that? for us, you know, um, and, you know, really questioning it. No, and, and what traditions we want to keep going for ourselves mm -hmm. and ask ourselves why, you know? Yeah, um, yeah like I, I have to accept, I love when men open the door for me in the car. I don't, I don't say that that has to be that way, but when it happens, I enjoy it. Not because but I, I enjoy it because I feel it like it's a gesture of like doing something for, for other, you know, it's not, the, it's not that it has to be that oh, way, yeah. you know, but in another, like, but also let's accept this. Like when we're walking in, I mean, and I don't want to take it far from art because we're talking about art, but when we're coming in a building or we're in an elevator and a man comes out before us in the elevator and he doesn't let us in, we're always like, <laughs> what a jerk, you know, but, what, but, but then, if, 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 if he does it, we like it, you know? So I think that it's important to ask ourselves these questions and why we, we, we like them and what we accept and what, what not, because, and I see this all the time in social media, it's all the time like, like, like saying this, this, and then, then, but we never point our, the fingers at, at ourselves or we like genuinely don't think about other people. You know, I'm all about pro-choice. I'm all about um, gay people adopting. Like I'm super progressive. Like I want to imagine that a lot of people is, but a lot of people are not. And everybody is like, oh yeah, we should have um, we should have a free, we should have free birth control, you know? But if you're Catholic and you're not pro birth control, why do you have to pay with your taxes someone that does think the other way than you, you know? I mean, I think we talked about this Colette at some point as well. And there's a lot of tangents between that, but I want just just to say this example in the sense that we have to super make it personal and then also put ourselves in, in, in other people's shoes. And that would take us higher as a society, not only as women or men. Or, 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 I mean, there's a lot of work that we have to do as minorities, but I feel that us as minorities, we also have to, to like we all have to go deeper and make these questions like very, very personal instead of just judging what we read and what we see just ask them to ourselves and people don't ask those questions to themselves we we are in, in, in i think the world is really decadent i think that every every year is more decadent than the other and honestly i'm very pessimist i think that we're yeah. doomed for the worst as a human society in a way because people we're not internal anymore. We never ask these questions anymore. We just say what we think, but we don't really- well, I, don't, I don't know if it's even necessarily asking about how making it personal to you, but not making it like kind of being more empathetic to others and putting yourself in their shoes, like, right? Um, I'm not gonna say some, I'm not gonna say anything about the, um, birth control thing because that'll lead us down a path that <laughs> we may have a very long debate about but I do think that um you know I do think people ask themselves questions I just don't know if they're asking themselves questions I don't know if they're asking themselves the right ones um I think it's I think um that asking yourself the, like a lot of these personal questions can lead you down to actually becoming a little bit even more set in your ways than not. Um, and I think that's that's something, I think honestly having conversations with others is, you know, having these conversations with others, uh, learning from each other from an open mind um, is actually really, really more, really important. Um, I'm not gonna say one's more important than the other, obviously. Um, and you but, know, yeah. Or sorry, I was gonna say, and just like actually questioning your privilege because I think that is a big thing. Um, and the choices that you make, um, like you know, what what do you decide 
to either believe in or what, like, you know, who, who are you in this world? And then where are you opposed to others? Are you, you know, of an upper class? Are you of a minority or are you of a privileged person who is white? I mean, you know, we can speak as women saying that, you know, we've had these issues gender wise, but also like, you know, how about women of color? Um, or, you know, uh, of Asian descent, we, you know, they, you know, we're privileged, you know, compared to a lot of other people, right? Completely. Through also academic, academic wise, um, being able to go to an institution and be learning. And, and that's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this kind of conversations is, is going on because there it's opportunities to go deep in this question instead of only like reading news or social media or talking to others, you know, like opening up to other points of view. And by saying this, I want to, I want to take it to the audience. The audience hasn't really <laughs> said anything except Janet. Um, I know that Andrea sent a, a link um, that we should we should check out at some point as well. But I would love to open it to to other people to comment to debate. Yeah, Priscilla, go go for it. You can. You okay, can ask I have a question. Okay. Um, speaking of great women artists, uh, where do great women's art? Where is it seen? What is it about? Uh, among the women artists here tonight, who probably all aspire to be great, if we're <laughs> in some way, shape, or form, and affect people in a way that is, you know, profound, uh, entertaining, uh, give them pleasure, you know, whatever your intention is. So where where do we want to be? Where do we want our work? Um, you know, who's seeing it? One person might say, yeah, that's great. Somebody else is like, my five-year-old could do that. You know, we've all heard that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there's a big, uh, you know, there's a broad range here. So anybody could ch chirp in and say, oh, I think a great woman artist is somebody who, you know, does this or has this effect or is socially involved and in, you know what uh, it's, it's just throwing out like an open question here for anybody um, who wants to make great art sure i mean i think greatness <laughs> is um you know i mean i think we're all great here <laughs> so going off that um i don't think you know necessarily fame or being in a you know a blue chip gallery is going to necessarily make you great but maybe that's the audience where you can reach like you know i i believe art in itself can be a communication like it's a communication um visual communication and you know i think we that's how artists visual artists like ourselves really get to tell our stories our truths our beliefs and you know our political views what we you know whatever you want to talk about and um you figuring out what your your audience is as i do think really important and, and you know maybe that's not a gallery maybe it's more so at like you know a basement in a bar or you know may, it depends For on sure. yeah yeah you know um i also think though um for me personally, I, I like to put a lot of humor in my work and um, it, it actually makes me really happy when I see like little kids look at it because they're so like malleable at that age that, you know, what they're, they, what they're taking in is um, something they may not necessarily understand or even remember in five minutes from once they saw it but when they get older you don't really un you you don't know how it's going to impact them um and I really do think uh it's important to be um having those conversations with the younger generation um as well as people who maybe are just uncomfortable with your work and they don't like it but you know all any public publicity is good publicity you know <laughs> so someone's like telling their friend about how much they hated your work because of how <laughs> grotesque or like those those beliefs are too out there I mean that's just getting your point across in a way right you know 
making people think of, think about it. It like made it a mark. So I think that's how you become great. <laughs> I, I, love, I love that. That was a great answer. So just to have a little bit of order, I know that Priscilla wanted to ask a question and then Ran, Rande, am I saying your name correctly? Rande, yeah, Rande. it's Mia. Mia, Mia. So we're gonna, Priscilla, um, go for it. If someone has to like say something um, with Priscilla, go for it. But then let's just take in count that also Mia wants to ask a question. Hi, beautiful ladies. Um, it is impossible for me to uh, stop being um, vulnerable with the, the topic, right? And when I see uh, the personal work that you have done, it's impossible, obviously, to, to think in self-knowledge, right? And that also makes me think about how free that makes me and makes us. Um, but I have a, um, a tricky question for you. How do you manage your ego in your work? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> I think, again, we come to, to self-observation, no? In, with, with this, I mean, I think the selfie project had to had to do a lot, a lot with this, you know, and it just, it, it, it questions exactly that. What is the, what is the thin line between narcissism and, and self-love, you know? So yeah, and, and, and the line is at the end of the day that you have, well, in my experience that you, that you have to think about others in, in your process, no? You, because if, if you don't think about others, you become, or either too bitter or too too soft to say it in a in a way. So, I mean, also it's a tricky question because it the question can mean a lot of things. Like, how do you handle the how do you handle your ego in in your work? In, in my experience, I feel that my, that that my work is always a self a self reflection, even if it can get a little bit preachy sometimes. You know, like trying to prove a point or show something. At the end of the day. I, I, I do it for, for self-reflection and to understand the world in a different way and what happened and mm -hmm. how I see things. Yeah, I, um, I agree. I do. Actually, I think more so it's funny. I don't know if like, I mean, just going back to what we're talking about when it comes to like, like men being artists versus women being artists. I like, not that... I feel like with like, like the ego, um, I don't know if that question would even be <laughs> asked with like, you know, male artists, because I'm just thinking of like Jeff Koons and, you know, or like, you know, cause and stuff like that, where their egos are so inflated and, you know, but that's like how they're known, right? Um, and I do think us as women, just because of society going back to how we're, you know how how what's what we're in we internalize in the world is that like um i do find that we could be possibly a little bit more actually like self-critical um which is almost the opposite of being too egotistical but more like letting us have that ego um and you know obviously watch it don't let it get too inflated but i think it's important for us to understand that like whatever we are doing, we, we deserve it. You know, well, we deserve to have a voice and we deserve to make our work and we deserve to have it shown, um, you know, and be collaborative, I think is also something that helps with that because then we understand each other, um, you know, whether you're being collaborative with another woman or, you know, collaboration in general. So I think that's something that's really helpful in that circumstance. I also think that ego is a tool mm -hmm. as well. and I think that you have to have a relationship with it that sometimes it's going to be positive and sometimes it's going to be negative sometimes the ego is going to eat you in a project sometimes you're going to be able to uh, control it sometimes you're going to be able to learn from it I think that in the end this related to survival ego in a society that's why we need recognition right it's inevitable 
the, this need of recognition. But I do agree with Colette that with collaboration, you also sort of smooth it a bit. But I do think that sometimes it has to be present. Sometimes the work is about that. So I think that as long as it doesn't take control of your life and the decisions you make over the work so that it keeps its honesty, it's okay. Like we all have egos, we need it to be in a society, you know, like, so I do think that it's uh, about building a relationship with it and learning how it plays a role in art making, in your work, I don't know. Mm, yeah, Mom, let, you know what, uh, okay, we have to let also Mia, Mia talk. I know that you, do you have a question, but you, okay, go for it. And then we have to circle around to, to Mia. Okay, no, I just wanted to, to point that. I think everybody gets their ego like grown when, when we are, um, when, when people tell you how, how good is it or how they like it, how much they like it. Like, it's like, your ego grows immediately when somebody says, oh, what a nice paint or what a nice installation or whatever. So you get like, start like, like a chicken getting bigger and bigger with the feathers. So it's, it's I think it's a really nice feeling, no? I just wanted to say that. It's, it's really, to, to piggyback on that, I think, yeah, I mean, it, of course it's a nice feeling, but what when, what, what when is the other way around when your work doesn't, doesn't get choice and chosen? And um, I feel also that, that a way to deal with the ego is rec recognizing the work of others. A uh, really recent experience, I was, uh, I was applying to to do a mural in, a, in another hospital. I had the opportunity to do a mural in a hospital in November and it was an experience that I loved so much and it changed my life that I started literally, for, I want to pursue the opportunity to do more murals. So I started to apply to all this open calls I had to do with murals. And I applied to like five of them and I got, I, I literally, when I was applying, my hopes were super high, my ego was super high. It's like, I used to this amazing mural. So of course I'm gonna be accepted and I'm a woman and I'm from Mexico. So right now, Everything is up for the mayor, the, the minorities. I'm gonna do very well. And I honestly, I, I knew that they were not gonna choose me in, in the five murals, but I knew that I had a chance, right? And a big chance. And then I didn't get accepted into any of them. And I actually went into the open calls to see who were the artists that got chosen to do the murals that I wasn't, that I didn't get chosen. And when I started to see their work, I was like, oh my God, these artists are magnificent. I'm not saying that they're better than me, but that's a question that I didn't even ask myself. I was just looking at their work and I was like, oh my God, of course I didn't get chosen. These people are incredible. And I knew more work about art. Knew, I knew more about their work, read about their work. And I'm like, oh, I'm like what were you thinking? <laughs> of course, these artists were incredible. They got chosen before you, you know? So I think that, um, Dealing with ego is looking, looking at others and not comparing ourselves that, that, that much. But I, I want to shut up now and let Mia speak because I know that you wanted to say uh, something. Thanks, Aranza. Uh, thank you. Beautiful presentation, Heidi and Aranza. You really pulled this amazing stuff together. I'm, I'm really loving it and haven't been feeling well and you really have lifted my spirits. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to say something. It has to do segues beautifully from ego and supportiveness because we talk a lot about men stomping on women. But I think I've felt a lot of of um, international women's salon exception is the exception to the rule. To me, there's a lot of uh, stomping amongst women towards women. And I think there's a lot of jealousy, there's a lot of competition, not healthy competition. I had the opportunity to speak to Gloria Steinle about this once. And when she, when they were starting the original feminist movement, she, she said declaratively, assertively, there was so much jealous, negative competition between them, Betty for Dan and, you know, all of them. And it's, I feel it today too. I mean, there's a lot of women's groups I go to and they're not supporting each other enough. And I just wondered what you all thought about that because I don't, I haven't exhibited a lot or, you know, I've performed somewhat, but not in groups so much. And um, I just wondered what you felt about 
is there enough support amongst women towards other women? Especially, I think it's incredibly important to do that towards younger women who are, you know, and, and it's really sad to me that that's the state to me. I don't, I, of course, there are some phenomenal women who are supportive, but I think the majority of my experience is that it's the opposite. And I just wondered what you all thought about that, which is sad to me. Uh, I think that also at the end of the day, all this thing about competition, I mean, I don't know if it's human nature or it's just that we can also circle it back to a patriarchal society that is based on who has more money? What am I going to do to have a better business than you? You know, and I don't know if that's human nature or if it's really a patriarchal society who has ingrained this unhealthy competitions, you know? So, I mean, it's so funny because I, when you were saying that, I was thinking about a friend who is a, uh, who is a pole dancer and she works in nightclubs and she's saying that it is incredible that the competition that goes inside the, like before they go out dancing, it's always like, who's gonna be wearing the most flashy thing? Who's gonna, they fight with the DJ to see who's gonna dance first. I mean, it's a very stupid example because if we compare it to art and like- No, it's good dancers, example. It doesn't have anything to do, you know? But at the end of the day is, uh, if we're, it's it, competition can, there can be healthy competition because how are we going to push each other forward if we don't have something higher to admire right like if we don't have something to look up to how are we gonna push ourselves and if in a way everything was kind of in the same in the same place i mean we can see it with countries right now i mean i don't want to get very political but i mean north korea cuba they're not competing in the world because they're just in a, it you know like I mean, maybe this was a very stupid example, but what, what I mean is that there can be a healthy competition. And at the end of the day, I think it comes to, again, ownership, having security in what you do and pushing other artists to get what, what they're doing. Something that I pushed myself. Um, and again, it's not to say to do it about me, but I always think that talking personal makes the point a little more clear. Uh, I made the promise to myself to always help other artists a few years ago. So if I have an open call, I share with all my artist friends, even if I know that my chances to not get picked are gonna be lower because I share that, you know? Yes, we're always gonna run into getting our work copied and, and all those stuff, but at the end, what are we gonna think about the positive or the, or the, or the negative? I think that sharing at the end of the day pushes, pushes you way, way, further than if you keep it. I know that if I share that open call to all my artist friends, it's gonna bring me back something higher, something better, something bigger than if I kept it for myself. I feel that that unhealthy competition and holding things from ourselves puts us in a, in a lesser position that if we actually share with others and give others the opportunity to become better. I think this makes you better giving the opportunity of others to be better. At the end of the day, what do you want to base your decisions? Do you want to base your decisions in hope or you want to base your decisions in fear? Because you can base your decisions. You can, this is the only two way to go, you know? Ask yourself, which is the wolf that you want to feed? I don't want to share. I don't want to give because then I'm not going to get an opportunity or I'm going to give trusting that at the end of the day, something is going to come back to me a thousand times bigger and and and. I'll just, I'll just add to that a little bit. Uh, um, I think uh, part of uh, human nature is, you know, if someone has something, it's less for me to have. And, and, uh, and also a patriarchal society feeds into that. So this, this uh, end sun game, right? So if this person has this, so if this woman has this spot or this commission or whatever, that means I will, have it so I think sometimes the the women get our our the sense of competition is comes from that 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 there's not enough out there like Arantz is saying right so if we start as women leading by example and opening up opportunities as Arantz said sharing sharing open calls uh, creating events for other women whether it's just a small you know gathering or 
bringing a couple, inviting a couple other women musicians to a show and introducing them to your network, et cetera. It's, it's gonna take work, but um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it is out there, um, but I think a lot of it's because there's a fear factor of, of not uh, being able to succeed because the opportunities are being taken away. And I think we just have to, you know, sort of just lead by example and, and just keep offering it out there. And, um, you know, eventually it will, it will change, but it's gonna be a lot of work for each of us to, to help younger uh, uh, girls and our, our, our uh, you know, um, people in, in our circle, people outside of our circle. Yeah, and at, at the end of the day, it's not as hard. I mean, the, the, the fight for equality is not as hard as we, as we think. It's just a matter of being really uh, inclusive. It's just a matter about being inclusive, but not tokenize it as, as, as Colette was saying, you know, like, oh, this woman artist, this, we have a person of color, we have a woman artist, like it's, 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 it's not about that. It's like truly, truly making it exclusive. I wanna give another um, example recently uh, that we can circle it to this talk. I will, I, I'm, <laughs> my boyfriend and me are going through this spree of watching like all these Disney movies, right? Like all the old Disney movies. And it's incredible how stereotypical, sexist, <laughs> racist they are, but they're so subtle because they're made for children. And of course, society didn't think in the way that we are thinking right now. And what's happening right now is, for example, the late lady and the tramp, uh, the one that they made nowadays, because you know, like Disney is doing this morph to like making everything with like real humans and whatever. The point is that the, the lady and the tramp, what, which the original is super stereotypical. Um, this, I don't want to sound this I don't want to come out in the wrong way, but if you see the one nowadays, it's super boring, super politically correct. Like it's, it's, it's terrible when the one in Disney, even if it was super wrong, it was kind of kind of funny in a way, you know? So how do we see these things that are so problematic without, I mean, you, you, you get what, what I mean. And, and, and talking about this, and, and actually talking about this with a very mixed group, you know, women, people of color, Asians, like it was a, a big group in the park talking about this. And we came with a conclusion that the problem was that it was only white male writing this, this cartoons, you know? And if you see the lady and the tramp, they forced it a lot, you know, all these politically correct terms, like you see it and it's super forced. If, 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 the, if from the beginning, the people that were writing this series and were producing these cartoons was mixed from the beginning, if it was a group of women, people of color, Asians, all this group creating and writing the cartoon, it would come out completely different because when you are from the internal way, mixing it up with all kinds of people, the result is gonna be something that that people are going to be happy rather than trying to fix something that it's not fair from the beginning because we're still in a very patriarchal society and a lot of people in Disney are still white males you know so this is circling back to yeah to in inclusivity things are gonna be fair and balanced when we start practicing inclusivity. It's not, it's not like, oh, but then like women are gonna take over, people of color are gonna take over and then we have to like, then we're gonna have a, an international men's day like in 200 years, right? To like circle it back. Like, no, like that's not the point, you know? The point is to like be fair, you know? Because if people's like, oh, then these minorities are gonna reign and then again, this is gonna reign to that. And that has been history all the time, one reigning against each other. And that is not, not, not the point. I think we yeah. have to stop, stop seeing each other as a threat, no? Mm -hmm. What were you gonna say when I interrupt? Oh, no, no, you were fine. Um, I was gonna say, I mean, even, uh, you know, going back to like competition and things, I think that it's not only about just, I don't even know if that's necessarily only a, 
a gender problem as it is how our infrastructure and the way that what's the type of the society we leave, we live in like you know um just going off of like an, a capitalist society of like you know competitions made and that's how the economy is supposedly supposed to work right um and so you know one man fends for himself or one woman <laughs> fends for herself right, so to speak and i think you know art has always like unfortunately has uh fell in that you know the art market is, itself is completely uh built on competition you know and i don't know i think that has a lot to do with it um you know which you know supporting women and you know going back to what aranza saying is not just by like having this like inclusive inclusivity in the sense of like oh we have a woman there but like ch really changing the infrastructure of in which how this the art world really does work right um you know really really changing how it, it's centered and like make and con reconstructing another way in which you know, it works for everybody rather than just tokenizing and having artists come up and being like, oh, we have this space of the gallery. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. So we have like two more minutes to go. Someone wants to say something before we, uh, we wrap it up. Thank you to both of you so much. And, and thank you to Haiti as well. This is yeah, this is great. Awesome. Thank you for <laughs> having us. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. We, I have to accept that I were, I mean, yeah, not only because I was, I was speaking, but the, the topic is very, it's, it's, it's very loaded, you know, so I was very, very nervous about today. So thank you. <laughs> everybody for making it making it happen showing showing up and i hope that there's an opportunity for more of this conversation so if you're thinking how can i support how can i help just see in your communities and with your friends how you can keep pushing people forward you know how can you help your friends your female friends your people someone that is just in even in a tiny less privileged position than you think how you can like share those voices because at the end of the day competitivity I think it's an illusion if you really own own your security and help help other other people so yeah thank you thank you very much Priscilla thank you you have been in all the talks oh my goodness <laughs> this is so nice Janet as well thank you for all the people thank you for all the men that are here as well, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's important to have men, because at the end of the day, yes, it's, a, it's about us. It's about us. Yeah, maybe it's her turn right now in a way, you know, but it is not only about, about us. Actually, a lot of, a lot of um, male artist friends are saying like, right now I can't apply to anything because I'm a white male and I, I'm not gonna get chosen into any open call. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, but yeah, it's her turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's her turn again. <laughs> you know I don't know in a way it's like that's true like friends from friends are saying like I can't they're not being chosen about anything right now because I'm a white male and it's like well <laughs> sorry not sorry <laughs> <laughs> but no it's really about it's really about inclusivity like us in the, in the artist salon as well we we have a lot of men cooperating with us you know or, or yeah so it's 9 p.m thank you everyone Heidi do you want to do this this yeah, I'll, I'll just do a close. Thank you to Lorenza and Colette and Paola. Thank you so much for uh, the fantastic presentation and uh, introducing some of us who never, uh, including myself, uh, was introduced to this uh, manifesto. So uh, even though I've known about some of the topics, but thank you so much. And to uh, our audience for being here, um, every uh, shape, form and location around the world. Um, and one thing I'd just like to uh, leave you with besides inviting you to our closing on Friday, April 2nd in person. But if you can't be there here in New York City in person, let one of us know, either an artist that you know in the show or Aranza or I, we will put you on our camera, on our video, and we will 
bring you to the uh, closing via, via the phone. Um, and this show will go on uh, in perpetuity online. There'll be ways to engage and, and see the talks online, uh, see the, the, the catalog and the, and the video uh, virtual show. So lots of ways to engage um, through the week and, and ongoing. And I'd just like to invite everybody to um, connect with International Women Artists Salon ongoing throughout the year. Uh, it's all about connecting, raising up women's artistry, partnering with our male colleagues and partners and fans and supporters and raising up women's artistry. And one thing I'd like to leave you with, um, we each have the power and the light within ourselves. Believe in it and we can make the change together. So thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you, well. everybody. We'll send an email with the links to all our videos, with the links for all the reg registration for the closing. So don't worry, you'll receive all the all the information. Thank you so much for Thanks, being Aranta. here. And Thanks, Heidi. Thank you, Mia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Have everybody. a lovely evening, everyone. See you again. Oh, the closing of our talk. I can't believe it. Mia, <laughs> we'll talk tomorrow. Oh. Thank you again, Aranza and Heidi. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. ladies. Ah. Thank you. Nice to see you, Andrea. Thank you so much for being here. Andrea. Yeah. Rika. Check out that article I sent the link to. Sorry? Check out the article that I sent the link to. Yes. You know what? I already opened it in my computer to have it there ready yes. when like, I shut the screen. There's a story about how this artist she created this statue of Salvador Dali, took it to the bull ring, and then it exploded and and bled all over the, over the ring. Wow, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I have that. it. I have it open there, and I can also share that in the yeah. Yeah. in the email. Thank you so so so. You, Your everybody. talk was great, Andrea. I have to say it. I have to mention it. Your talk was. I have to confess that when I had to tell you that you had reached your your twelve minutes, actually not ten, because I let you go a little bit further. I I was like, oh, because it was it was so good. So. Yeah, well, that was my voice. I think I was screaming at that point, at least on paper. So. No, that was that was fantastic. That was really fantastic, really deep and and meaningful. So I think we have to go. Someone's waiting hey, for me to have dinner. Paola, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's so late. It's like two in the morning for you right now. Paola oh. is in London. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> Okay, so I'll Good see morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, I'm gonna end the session for everyone, okay? Okay. okay. Bye. Good night, I love you. Adios. Adios. <laughs>